Hey everyone, we are back with another video, and this one is going to be on the types of inguinal hernia repairs. And wanted to cover this topic because there's just so many options, especially with the advent of advances in laparoscopic surgery uh, for ways to repair inguinal hernias. I think it can be really easy, especially as a medical student, to get completely caught up in all the minutia of all these different options. And I think if we really break it down uh, into its simplest form, there's a couple key rules that will help guide your way through this maze of options and get you to at least a right answer, if not specifically the right answer your attending chooses at that time. And so to start, let's make sure we're all on the same page with a quick bit of anatomy review. Uh, what are hernias? Hernias are really just defects um, anywhere in the abdominal wall. And the problem with having a defect in the fascia of your abdominal wall is that things can slip through there, either omentum or fat or bowel. And that can either, either cause pain or worst case scenario, something like bowel slips in there and loses its blood supply and actually dies and infarcts and makes people really sick. So usually these are either fixed for pain on an elective basis or emergently for uh, dead gut, which can be a pretty stressful situation. And so to start, we're gonna talk about open inguinal hernia anatomy. And I say open, I put this in quotation marks because this isn't really open surgery. If you think about the term laparotomy, uh, which is what we call an incision we make in the abdomen, that lap really refers to making an incision all the way down through that last layer of the abdominal wall. If you don't know your layers, you can check out our abdominal access video. Uh, but that last layer is that peritoneal lining of the abdominal cavity. And when you cut that, that's technically when you make a laparotomy and do an open procedure or do a laparoscopic procedure if you're doing minimally invasive surgery. And when we're doing open hernia repairs, we're not actually usually going through that peritoneal layer. We're kind of cutting down through all the layers to that point and then fixing them over top. So we do refer to this as open though, just to uh, provide a counter term towards when we're using the laparoscope and doing more minimally invasive topics, but just so you know, it's not truly open surgery. And so just to review kind of the anatomy again, as a medical student, usually you're going to get pimped on things like what's in the inguinal canal, what are important nerves, and we'll cover those topics. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on the other anatomy because it's actually very difficult, um, either from a 3D perspective or just from all the different layers. And I don't think there's a real good way for me to teach you even over this sort of video format. It's just gonna take looking at a lot of different pictures from a lot of different angles and familiarizing yourself with that anatomy. So this is intentionally a not thorough review of anatomy, but hopefully it hits the high points that you might get, get asked in the operating room. And so when we're thinking about contents of the inguinal canal, uh, usually people talk about this from the, the male physiology perspective because there's kind of more uh, structures that cannot be sacrificed. So we think about, of course, the vas deferens, uh, the testicular artery and the pampiniform venous plexus, and then we also have a bunch of important nerves. For example, we have the genital branch of the genital femoral nerve. And then we also have the ilioinguinal nerve. Uh, not even going to bother typing this out. And then finally, we have the iliohypogastric nerve. And so why don't we just pull up a quick picture of this for a quick picture of this and talk about why those nerves are important. And so to orient you here, this is, we're looking at a person, this person would be facing us, this is an anterior view, and we're looking at kind of the left um, inguinal region, right? So there's typically an incision made, maybe two finger breaths above, or above the inguinal canal, and then we cut down through those layers of the abdominal wall, through the skin, through the campers and scarpus fascia. And then what you're seeing here, this structure is the external oblique uh, aponeurosis that's been opened. And now we're able to see the inguinal canal right here, the structures of the inguinal canal. This is actually after a repair has been done. So this is a, an open mesh repair. This would be called a Lichtenstein. We'll talk about that later. But what I really wanted to highlight here is we have the inguinal canal structures right here. And what we want to think about is there's the ilioinguinal nerve that runs here kind of on top of these cord structures. And then kind of on the bottom, 
oftentimes not even really able to see. We have the genital branch of the genital femoral nerve. And then up here, if we just kind of going cranial towards the head, usually a little bit above this whole area, we have the iliohypogastric running somewhere up there. And these nerves are important because if you incorporate them in one of your sutures, you can give this your patient um, what's called pubalgia or neuralgia, like a long-standing um, neurologic pain from damaging those nerves. And especially since we're usually during, doing these repairs on a, an elective basis to help with pain, it's a really pretty devastating complication if you've given people chronic uh, groin pain issues related to your repair. So a lot of people will try to identify these nerves during the repair to prevent them from being injured. So that's all I wanted to talk about with open anatomy. Now we'll briefly talk about the anatomy that you see from a minimally invasive or laparoscopic perspective. And so this, I'm not even going to try to draw anything. We'll just pull the picture up right now. So this is a nice anatomic image. Over here on the left, you see they have represented kind of what things might look like with the peritoneal covering over it. This is really just highlighting the structures themselves over here on the right. And so usually when you're looking at this from inside the body, it's really disorienting. And I recommend looking for areas on either side of the abdomen where you're seeing stuff kind of disappear into the abdominal wall. And that is going to be your deep inguinal ring entering the inguinal canal. And hopefully that can help you get your bearings. And so here we need to think about what type of hernias we can have in the groin. So of course there's inguinal hernias and we have direct and indirect, but we also have femoral hernias. And so as you probably remember from your anatomy class, there's a triangle that represents direct inguinal hernias, which is the lateral border of the rectus right here, the inguinal ligament right here, and then the inferior epigastric vessels right here. So this is Hesselbeck's triangle in which a defect there is known as a direct inguinal hernia. And then if we think about those structures and go lateral, here is that internal ring or deep ring where structures slide through for an indirect inguinal hernia. So direct inguinal hernia, indirect inguinal hernia. Our last hernia to think about is a femoral hernia. So you probably remember the navel mnemonic for your femoral structures. So we have our nerve, artery, vein, and then this empty space right here, which is you know, under the inguinal ligament. That is where a femoral hernia occurs. Finally, something else you might have heard of is called the triangle of doom and the triangle of pain. Of course, when we're doing a surgery, we really don't want to cause any more bleeding than we have to. You see there's a couple big blood vessels down here, your inguinal or femoral artery and vein. And we like to call that the triangle of doom. So if you see the vas deferens here, that's this white structure going into the internal ring. Then you have your gonadal vessels right here. So gonadal vessels, vas. So this area in between those is called the triangle of doom. And it's called that because of the large blood vessels running to the, directly underneath. And then the triangle of pain is just lateral to that. So once again, one side is the gonadal vessels. The other side is this inguinal ligament. And you see there's multiple nerves uh, coming into this space with probably, if you're gonna memorize one of them, think about the lateral cutaneous nerve. Uh, damaging that with attack can give people uh, issues with pain in that nervous distribution. All right, so we've kind of belabored the anatomy a little bit. I know I said I wouldn't talk about it a lot. Don't get too hung up on it. Uh, we really want to talk about the different types of repair in this video. So first we have what I said is kind of a quasi open repair. That's where we're making a big incision on the skin and kind of working our way down to where the hernia is versus the minimally invasive or laparoscopic repair, of which there are two types. One is your TAP. We're gonna talk about both of these more later. And the other is your TEP. This one is essentially, the TAP is like a standard laparoscopic approach and the TEP is a little bit different. But once again, we'll get into all those later because I think it's important to know why we might do one of these two repairs. And so remember, we're thinking about hernias, right? So we've got fascia and somewhere there's a hole in the fascia where stuff can get out, right? So obviously to repair that, we just want to fix this hole. Either you can fix it by just trying to close the hole, right? By bringing tissue together on either side. Or if you have a hole, you can fix it by laying something strong over top of it, like a mesh. 
And so mesh repair, this is the gold standard. This is the default repair. If you think about it, if a hole formed there in the first place, that tissue probably wasn't that good. So just bringing it together is probably not going to be your best option for a long durable repair. Uh, also, if you think about, especially with a bigger hole, if you're trying to approximate two edges together, you can have a lot of tension, which is not good for healing. So you, a lot of times you'll hear about mesh repairs as being called tension free, which is good for blood supply, good for healing. And so why do we ever not do a mesh repair and do, and so the, the reason we would do a tissue repair also called a primary repair is because mesh is a foreign body and anytime you have a risk of infection or contamination, for example, if there was dead gut in the repair or if some gut had perforated and there was just um, succus or stool in the surgical field, anytime you're really worried about an infection, you don't wanna put mesh in there, bacteria will seed the mesh and lead to a long-term infection that's really hard to clear. And so in those cases, you'd have to do just a tissue repair knowing that it's more likely to fail in the future and might need uh, another mesh repair uh, at some point. So remember, if this is an emergent case, there's contamination, the bowel's compromised, the bowel's perforated, and you need to do a tissue repair and just get out, that is only going to be available through these types of open hernia repairs as opposed to those minimally invasive. There's no way to do a minimally invasive repair without a mesh. And so for some quick bonus points, this is not key information, but if you want to dig a little bit deeper, there's two main types of tissue repairs, open tissue repairs. One is called a bassini. That takes care of your inguinal hernias only, so direct or indirect inguinal hernia. Um, but for example, if you have a femoral hernia, you'd have to do what's called a McVeigh repair. And it can also be called a Cooper's ligament repair based on the structures that are being brought together. And this is really, really bonus points, but we'll just talk about this briefly. If we're looking kind of in this inguinal space right here, your cord's running somewhere like this. Uh, the bassini repair is going to bring together the conjoint tendon medially and the Popert's ligament laterally, which is just kind of that. Um, if you think about the how the inguinal canal comes down and hooks up like this, Popart's ligament is just this hook part on the inside. So you bring those two together for Bassini repair, whereas for the McVeigh repair, there's a little bit deeper structure called Cooper's ligament. I'm not going to even try to draw that for you, but you're actually bringing the conjoint to Cooper's ligament for the McVeigh repair. And all you really need to know as a medical student is that that is your option uh, if you need to repair a femoral hernia. And then, so what if you're doing an open repair, but you want to use that gold standard mesh to have a really good long lasting repair and you can do it because your field is not contaminated. That is called a Lichtenstein repair. And so that's actually almost just like the Bassini repair from the last page where we're connecting the conjoint tendon to the Popart's ligament. But this time, instead of pulling those tissues together under tendon, under, ten, under tension, we can just lay a mesh in this area and sew it in and have a more durable and tension-free repair. All right, so we've talked about two types of open repair, two main types, uh, but now we're gonna focus on the laparoscopic repairs. So why do we do laparoscopic repairs instead of open? Well, of course, anytime you're doing an open procedure, you have a bigger uh, incision, which can cause more pain. It's in the groin, so there's a risk of it getting infected. We talked about those risks of inguinal neuralgia or pubalgia if you would damage those nerves which are more exposed in the open hernia repair. It can be more difficult to fix a femoral hernia if you don't know what type of hernia you're going to be working on. Uh, and so all those are reasons why laparoscopic repairs can have advantages. And the two things I want you to really remember that contrast them to open repairs, all of these will require a mesh and they can repair all your types of inguinal hernias. So indirect inguinal, direct inguinal, as well as femoral hernias. And so like I said briefly before, you have your TAP. This stands for transabdominal preperitoneal. That's basically your standard laparoscopic surgery where you go in all the way through the peritoneum and you look into the pelvis uh, kind of just like you would in any other type of laparoscopic surgery versus a TEP, which is uh, totally extra peritoneal where you never violate the peritoneum at all. You kind of stay superficial to it. And so to make that a little bit more concrete with an image, here you can see this is the 
abdominal cavity right in here. This kind of brown area represents a space that's walled off by the peritoneum. And so for a tap repair, transabdominal preperitoneal, we actually go through the peritoneum and we're kind of, all these organs, of course, would get pushed down and we'd end up looking towards the pelvis just like that. Whereas for a tap repair, I can actually bring up a different image. Oh, that's really grainy. But you can see this is the peritoneum in this case. So we went through the layers of the abdominal wall down to the peritoneum and actually insufflated this space. So it keeps all the organs down and out of the way. And we're just able to work on our anatomy in the pelvis right there. And so if we're thinking about it from how we're looking, uh, once we have the laparoscope in the patient, if we're doing a tap repair, that might be this view over here where you have the peritoneum in place, you usually have to make an incision in the peritoneum and kind of peel it down to open up this space to work on it. Whereas a TEP, you kind of are able to see these structures without the peritoneum in the way. And then when it goes to fixing, right, we just are essentially trying to lay a mesh, something like this, where we're covering our direct hernia space, remember Hesselbach's triangle, our indirect hernia space and our femoral space, all with one mesh. And you can do both of these from either approach. Really, this is just surgeon or institutional preference. There isn't much data to say that one is any better than the other. All right, so that's it. Kind of a long, complex video on a somewhat complex topic. Just remember that when you're thinking about fixing a hernia, think about if you would want to do it open or lap or MIS. Know your two types of lap procedures if you would choose to do it. Remember that you can only do those procedures if you're able to place a mesh. Open, you can do with or without mesh. Um, so in those contaminated cases, you're really going to be thinking about an open procedure to just do a tissue repair. Um, and the other thing to think about is your patient's surgical history. If somebody has had a history of an open or a lap repair in the past, those planes are gonna be really hard to dissect a second time. So usually we want to switch and go to the opposite type of repair. Uh, once again, the anatomy itself is really difficult. Uh, try to, my best advice is try to look at a bunch of images and just really look at it from different angles and put things together on your own. If you guys want, we could try to do a video on that specifically, but it would have definitely been too much for this video today. Uh, once again, these videos are for educational purposes only, do not use them to diagnose or treat any diseases, and we'll see you next time. Thanks.